Yeah, yeah. yeah. Be fit. yeah. It's like actually, I'm gonna say. What, what sort of things? You've got this, obviously, you can show off. Yeah, just so it's sort of creature design. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, about one thing that this I one, yeah. My luggage. Yeah. Uh, Believe me, I know. Yeah, so I mean, I just had a question so you can feel the Sure. That's a creature design. Anything. Yep. So, uh, so I think it's one ash. It's, it's 330. 130. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Having a good convention so far? Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Nice. We'll give it another minute or two here and then get started. <laughs> Sorry. I also was looking for you earlier. I uh, put in a call to uh, Cheetah, the hotel, about the uh, sprinkler things falling down. It is what it is. If that's all that's happening, it's not that big of a deal. Well, we're starting to just plop. There you go. I was just going to show you. Dueling microphones. I have a question. Are you, are you a cheater? I, apparently. <laughs> it specifically says not a cheater. That's a very big... When you go into, um, like, Animal Kingdom, Phylum, Class, Species, all that, not a cheetah is everything that's not a cheetah. So it's most of the animal kingdom. Okay. I think I know. What's funny, there's a gentleman whose real life name is Cheetah on staff here, yeah. and he has one of those. I think he actually might have been the person. That's his actual name. That's his actual name. That's fantastic. I felt bad because I knew him before he legally changed his name. And he, I believe, actually works at Argonne National Laboratory, <laughs> um, which makes that even more interesting. Does that um, change the security clearance if you I don't know. I, I don't know if that's better or worse. Uh, if they're more reliable, they're stealthy. they are stealthy. Um, very fast. Um, the there was a there's a YouTube channel I was watching, and a gentleman um, is a physicist, a particle physicist, uh, that is in a band that does a lot of parody songs and stuff. Uh, and he made the mistake of announcing to his employer that he was going to leave his job and go make like songs about video games for the rest of his life and he made the mistake of resigning on April 1st so they didn't think he was being honest but yeah but he felt it was a good time he also was living in London and he didn't want to raise his daughter in London with his wife so he came back to the States it was a small portion of it but it was a fun story also. Want to go ahead and get started? Oh, sure. Yeah, let's do this. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Creature Creation Panel with uh, our guest of honor, Russ Adams. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out. Russ, I'm going to leave you down a couple things you'd like to talk about, and then we'll take questions and answers. Oh, um, I guess just... So, I do special effects for a living, so I can, like... Yeah, and I, I heard about yours too. That was fantastic. Cause we actually worked for the same company at some point, uh, Jim Henson Creature Shop. Oh, you didn't work for the Jim? Okay. Um, so I, I've I've, um, I've done a lot of creature design uh, for a bunch of films and stuff like that. Um, I got some uh, like some easy go-to things that you guys might not have thought about cheats that we use in Hollywood that uh, we would never tell anybody about. You know, so um, anything that you guys might have. This is basically how I can kind of like give you guys information on your next build or your next uh, project. Um, anything from puppets to, to creatures, um, like uh, suits. Um, we do, God, we do everything. Uh, so essentially, I just wanted to, you know, some of the things that I've worked on have been Pirates of the Caribbean, two and three, um, 51st States. We just did a film uh, with Danny Trejo. Uh, it's called Juarez 2045. I got to build these big androids in, uh, what else have we done? Oh, I got a film coming out. It'll be coming into theaters uh, March uh, 2018. It's called Hashtag Screamers. It's the first film that I actually got to create the villain, and it was totally mine, and I was, I was just like, kitty, like an idiot, you know? You know, because it's kind of a big deal when you get to be the guy that's, because you're just not on the list. 
you know, with pirates, I'm so far down on the list, the things that I've done, you know, that <laughs> there's like hundreds of people above me, and you literally have to wait till the end of the credits to see my name. Um, so, so anything that you guys um, have questions with, that's what I kind of like to do with this particular panel, and part of me feels a little, a, a, a little intimidated because I've seen the suits that you guys create, and so I'm actually thinking that I'm probably going to learn more from you than you are from me. So you know, to the door swings both ways. So, any questions? Start off. Yes. Yes, I'm uber famous. Is that your question? Okay, no, never mind. It's not <laughs> Actually, um, so I make bracelets and such, and I'm trying to create a better way for ventilation. So with your suits, how do you um, deal with people not overheating or um, yeah. ears? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, that's you have to think about when you're doing a cool suit underneath the suit. You have to think about core body temperature and where those things are going to be. So around the throat is a good area, you know, because these are pulse points. So you could put like um, like a cool. Uh, you know, band around their neck or something that they can attach and detach. Um, wrists are a good one. You definitely want to ventilate out the top of the head. I like to, uh, with the suits I build, like werewolf suits and things, I, um, I hair punch a lot of the, uh, the suit. So I can punch around the crown of the head. And so it's got like hair laying over, but there's a fan inside drawing out the heat. But as, in, as important it is to draw the heat out, you want to suck cool air in. So you can do that from almost anywhere. You know, um, if you've got a small fan that you can put in that's that's blowing the air through, you can you can pour it out the back or you can have it, you know, kind of sucked in the mouth, you know, in that kind of way it's going like this and, and cooling people off. So but it's incredibly important and I know you guys know this from wearing, you know, fursuits, but you have to have some way of keeping cool because we've actually had actors on the set that uh, does succumb to heat exhaustion because of those suits. Because a lot of the stuff that we build is made out of uh, upholstery foam. So upholstery foam gets really, really it's, it's, it might as well be insulation, you know? And so it traps body heat, and within, I mean, within no time, you can actually just have somebody fall out, you know? Um, with us, it's really kind of in between takes. So we can, we can take the actor off the set stick him over here and we we actually have these suits with these tubes that go across so we're plugging them into a water system and so water's going in one end and out the other but it's circulating ice water through the suit so it's actually cooling them off and then we're ready for the take you unplug them drain them and send them on its way so i know they actually use something similar to that for uh, uh, uh doctors in surgery they have vests that they put in people so that way they don't oh, have to it's become a pretty common thing for, uh, especially big guys, if they're yeah. fairly large. Um, you know, if you're in a surgery suite for four, six, eight hours, you gotta do something. Yeah. And it's a high stress situation, so. And it's really, it's really a good way of doing it. It's not practical for you guys, you know, because you're gonna want those ice pack vests and things like that. Definitely a small computer fan, you know, something that's low voltage you know, can be, can be, you know, really helpful. Um, magnet fans, um, like, I, I use magnet fans all the time because they don't require any power. It's just essentially the way you set the magnet up so that it actually spins the fan. So you're kind of cheating the laws of physics, you know, and <laughs> it's sort of working on its own. It doesn't put out a lot of power, but once it gets going and it's, it's going on a regular basis, it's actually pretty helpful. So um, you can find out designs for those on YouTube. You know, I'm sure there's a better name for it than magnet fan, you know, because we just sort of come up with our own. Muffin fan, computer, computer fan. fan. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of small, it's like a little hockey puck usually, maybe yeah. square shape. So, and you know, everybody has their own name for stuff in different shops, so you just kind of get with the lingo, but, you know. We got a question over here. I work in uh, 3D design and production, and I was wondering if you've uh, considered any applications for 3D printing in suit and costume construction? I, I did once upon a time, and then I just smashed the machine. Um, <laughs> there's a problem with, with, with 3D printers. I, I actually loved them when they first came out. I drove my wife nuts. We'd be walking through Walmart. We could 3D print. 
that, we can 3D print that, that, you know, I mean, she didn't want to go to Walmart or anything else with me ever again, you know, so, yeah, I won. So guys, keep that in mind. Uh, you know. But the printers that we use, sometimes we'll just make the prototype, you know, and then we'll mold it because back in the day when we first, back in the day, we're talking like a year or two ago, when we got our 3D printers, um, we thought that it was going to save us all this time. We wouldn't have to make molds for everything and then have all these molds on the shelf. We would just have them in a file on a computer and print them out and see how quick they came out. Unfortunately, they take like 18 hours for some of these things to print. And I can actually create from a mold like 20 to 30 copies in that amount of time, you know? So that's what we did. We just went ahead and we make the prototype with that and then make the silicone mold, whatever you need to make the mold out of to kind of like move on from there. Um, it's not, in my opinion, it's not the best route to take for having runoffs, you know? Um, and you always want to kind of schedule it so you're working on something else while that thing's doing that. And the other, the other downfall with 3D printers is one mistake and you start all over again. You can't just pick up where it made the mistake, and kind of go back a little bit and start with those layers. They haven't really gotten to that point yet. Um, so you're printing off all this stuff and it stops like almost three quarters of the way done and you're like, God, you know, 12 hours. You know, this is why machines fly through my shop. You know, and I'll have apprentices on the floor, and you'll hear, and here was a sewing machine or a 3D printer just hit the concrete wall, slid down, somebody go get me a new machine. You know, just take the company card, go, you know. I'm a violent creator. It's part of my process. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, as far as like making puppetry when it comes to making like fursuits and just uh, quad suits and such like that, would you recommend anything in regards to the material use to kind of make it easier? Because I'm looking to make two different ones. One of my actual Sona who is very raptor-like, but she's got like a really long neck. So I was going to like have my hand be able to control her head and kind of go like that big bird style. Yeah, that, that's actually a great idea. But in practice, it'll end up causing you more physical pain than you can imagine. Um, I was on a television show, hopefully somebody here has seen it. It was called the Jim Henson Creature Shop Challenge. It was on Sci-Fi, right? Right? Thank you, both of you. Um, you know, so, but you've seen the show, right? So episode two, we did a Skexis and from the Dark Crystal, and it was our own very, you know, variation. Please set aside the fact that I made Tina cry, all right? But it was a pretty successful creature, right? But we almost killed the puppeteer because he was doing that very thing. He had to, so he was in the shroud and the puppet head is like right in the front. And he had to kind of do one of these to keep it straight with the body. And he was starting to get tired and it was starting to list, you know? So essentially the creature looked like he was kind of like, which kind of worked at the same time. But I can feel it right now. If you kind of go like this, and you're trying to, to you're, you can feel your arm starting to go numb and your shoulder starting to kind of cramp. It's not a situation you want to put yourself in for a long period of time. So what I would suggest is doing something um, like a vest. Like um, we, I, I really love to use corsets for these things because we call them utilitarian corsets. And so they could be like a metal plate sewn in where you could actually anchor like a hinge you know, where you're sort of operating it from a more convenient location. And you can actually put what we call free animation into it, where it could be on a swivel, just a piece of tube coming out with a joint that allows it to kind of swivel like this. And so when you're walking, the head's sort of going like this. And that's free animation. It's nothing you have to do yourself. But when you're ready to interact with people, you can actually reach in there and act, you know, kind of move it around a little bit. So you can manipulate it and then set it back into place so it's in its auto <laughs> position. You know, back to one, you know, kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so that's what I would do. I wouldn't put yourself in that physical position because it, it'll really start, like, almost immediately your arm will start going numb. And, you know, although he, he kind of deserved it. You know, it was like, <laughs> I think he had an Oscar, so he, yeah, he had it coming. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, and so you remember the show, uh, Pete, Peter Brook was one of the masters, and Peter had hurt his back. So I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give him this in case somebody's recording this. Um, Peter hurt his back, and um, he was on some pain meds, and he started saying things that were cracking us up because there were things that you know you're not supposed to say when you're on a hot mic, Peter, you know? And so he's like, the worst thing you can do to a puppet is give it to a puppeteer. And he's like, they'll just trash it. They got no respect for design. And, and I'm like, Peter, you're on mic. You know, it's like, you're mic'd up, brother. You know? <laughs> so, anyway, so, and he's right, though. The worst thing you can do is give a puppet to a puppeteer and then just watch your work just disintegrate before your eyes. You know, nothing made us madder on the set than watching a puppeteer take your puppet to the extreme and then disintegrate in front of the judges because that's all they saw. You know, I can't tell you, I won't, I won't mention his name, but there was one individual on the show every time we did a, a shot with his creature, it didn't matter what week it was the head would pop off the creature and roll across the stage. And I thought, oh, Brian's gonna kick him off for this one. Well, we're gonna let it go. What? <laughs> this is a competition. My creature's head didn't pop off. <laughs> anyway, so that's what I would suggest. Oh, who else we got? Yes, we're, we're gonna swap your microphone real quick. Oh, we're gonna swap? Holy cow, that was at half. Do I talk that much? Um, okay, so a lot of the movies and stuff where you have creatures like werewolves and things like that, you get these really smooth transitions between like painted areas and furred areas, like kind of even on that mask there. Is there any secret? Is there a type of fur you guys are using or some kind of material or you're wefting? Like, what's the deal? So between the skin portion and then, it's just blending. Like, like with most of the fur suits that you guys see, it's, it's a fabric uh, fur, right? For us, it's a four-way stretch material. Also, it's a hair punch. So we, we take blended hair and we we'll punch it in with a needle. And that's why it does that really great cascade. Is that what you're talking about? And I actually have gotten so good at hair punching, I actually prefer it more than I prefer. Because, I mean, when I'm doing suits with fur in them, I'm actually hand-stitching everything because I don't trust the machine to do what I know I can do by hand, right? So um, I'll just say, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hair punch it. And, and so I'm punching in um, uh, one piece of hair at a time into the skin of my creatures. And every material is different, but latex can be a pain. That's what I was gonna ask, is latex or silicone skin? Or yeah. Latex materials? I, I suggest you practice on latex first, because once you get good with latex, you know, and then you try to hair punch silicone, it's like a dream. <laughs> you know, but if you do it to, to, to silicone, you get spoiled, right? You know, it's all like, yeah, God, that, that, that was just perfect. And then you go to latex and you're like, what the? I can't say, you know? <laughs> we, got, we got a minor in the front row. Um, <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Got a question over here. Sure. With regards to things like, I think it's a werewolf mask, actually, which, A plus. Thank you. Uh, are smooth on products worth the price that they pay for them? Or are those? Oh, yeah. All right. And they don't sponsor me at all, but they give me a lot of freebies. So, <laughs> so every month they get they come down to the studio. Hey, Russ, how's it going? We got a new product. Would you like to try it out? Well, it depends what you got. You know, and they start loading me up. I love smooth on, and I love my smooth on rep. You know. When you're dealing with a solid base or a somewhat solid base, more than like fabric would be, is Fiber flocking ever an option for applying fur? Flocking? Oh, yeah. Actually, it's a great combination. So if you want to, like I've done lions. I don't know if you guys have seen my website, but I like to do big lion masks and suits. And essentially, it, I flock it first, and then I will go ahead and go back and hair punch from there. Um, where there's different kinds of flocking, so you guys have to be aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. So with electrostatic flocking, you, the flock has to be a little like maybe two, uh, two millimeters, and then it goes up to ten. I can't find anything more than ten, but um, but yeah, you, that, for those you absolutely need an electrostatic uh, gun. And I bought my first one a couple of years ago after I came off the show. And just be prepared. All right, they're expensive and they're worth it, 
but they're also, it's a lightning bolt waiting to happen. You're gonna get shocked no matter where you are in the shop. And you can feel it. Like, I, hair on the, it just as soon as I turn it on, whoa, I, I was like, oh, I do have hair. <laughs> you know? And then, like, the cargo door for the shop is right next to the flocking gun, and I've had, like, three or four, even six inch bolts of lightning hit me from the door, you know? It, it, it's the worst kind of carpet thing you've got, you know? It's, you know? But it ends up not being dangerous then. No, it's not dangerous unless you have a pacemaker or something. I, I don't know for a fact. You want to talk to a doctor about that. But, you know, but it would be fun to watch. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, question here. Yeah. Uh, what kind of plastics would you recommend using in molds? Uh, what kind of mold? Um, Are you talking about to make a mold? Uh, no, or no, to the final product. Because I've been researching and there's a lot of uh, like polyurethane and polyethane yeah. and epoxy and a bunch of other small ones. If you're just getting started with mold making and stuff, um, there's a lot of quick, quick casting stuff that you can buy. I would suggest making silicone molds because even if it's a little more of a flexible plastic, you're still going to be able to get it out of there easily. Um, most of the plastics aren't flexible, you know, and some of them you don't want them to be. You know, and with a silicone mold, you just sort of, and it pops right out. Um, but it's, it's a great learning tool because you learn about undercuts and it's not going to come back and bite you because if it's, a, if it's a flexible mold and the rigid part, those undercuts don't really mean as much, you know? I mean, they do to a certain extent, but not as much as they would if that was a rigid mold with a rigid part. Just keep one thing in mind, when you're, when you're dealing with casting things, and casting is the part that comes out of the mold. A lot of people call that the mold, but it's not. So when you're talking to somebody in the industry and you say mold, they mean that negative piece that was created. The cast is what you pour into it and pop out. So to do those, um, it's, it's on, oh, there's a rule. So if it's, if it's a rigid part, then you want a flexible mold. If it's a flexible part, you want a rigid mold. Did I say that right? Did I just counter? Rigid part, flexible mold. Flexible part, rigid mold. Yeah, okay, for some reason I thought I told you to do both rigid. Don't, don't, don't go rigid. You know, don't go for rigid. So, anyway. Um, so yeah, that's a great way to start. Especially if you're dealing with plastic, make sure you have silicone mold. And, and I'm not pimping them here, but Reynolds Advanced, or uh, it's, it's, it's a company that is actually owned by Smooth on. Um, so, and they're actually the, uh, the, the distributors. So, if, you're, if, you're, if you go to, to, to those guys, um, I use Moldmax 30. It's great molding material. It does take forever to set up though, you know? So you're gonna have to walk away from it for a day. Cause it like literally it'll take like, seven, it's like 17, 12 hours to set up. So, but that's good because that gives it time for all those bubbles to rise and not everybody can afford a vacuum chamber to evacuate that stuff, so. Especially if you bought an electrostatic flocking gun, you know. Uh, got a question here? Yeah. So, um, approximately how long does it take you to make your pictures? Like, how long uh, does it take? It's, it's kind of different. Like, I usually give myself eight hours to sculpt or less. So if it takes me more than a day to sculpt, you know, I'm, I really kind of get, you know, kind of tough on myself. But that's sort of like what the industry requires. If you're working in a studio, you don't really have much time to knock out a sculpture. And because everybody in the industry seems to be a sculptor, you're a dime a dozen. So the faster you can do something, the better. Um, when we were talking about uh, the Jim Henson Creature Shop, when I sculpted the Skeksis head, I literally had two hours to sculpt that head. So, um, and that's kind of par for the course, really. This guy was probably more like, uh, maybe about four hours of sculpting, and then the rest was the mold making and the casting. So, if you were going to start with a latex mask, which um, this is going to sound some, you know, some really bad, you know, uh, self promotion here. I actually sell books on how to do this stuff. Uh, so, I got a book called uh, Latex Mask Making, and it teaches you how to go through every step, and it's about forty hours from one end to the other. It's not forty hours straight because you have to wait for molds to dry and stuff like that. But it's something you might want to check out. I mean, you know. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, well, like, how do you hot glue, like, bones together without, like, the hot glue going, like, out and then, like, bumping on the edges? Okay, so 
you want to glue two things together without yeah, without like anything on the outside like just oh like a nice flush yeah 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 you just use less glue you know and if you make a mistake a lot of people aren't don't realize this but if you pour some rubbing alcohol on it it'll break the bond of the hot glue so you can actually take it apart easily and start over again just make sure all the alcohol is gone when you clean it up because otherwise you put the new hot glue on there and the residue from the alcohol will actually break the bond there too so that way when you make a mistake it's not like going to ruin your whole project you can just pour some rubbing alcohol with parental supervision. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it touches though will all come apart. All come apart. Local, local. I actually, so when I'm making molds, I like to save clay. So I'll use wood blocks, of, you know, uh, two by fours that uh, I've chopped up and they just sort of sit in the corner and I'll hot glue those together. When you, when you lift a sculpture up to take those pieces off, you don't want to damage the sculpture. So you want it to come apart easily. So I just pour some rubbing alcohol and it even breaks free of the wood. The only thing I think you might have a really uh, kind of a difficult problem with would be anything with a fabric mesh on the back. But even then, it should come apart with some gentle moving because you don't want to you don't want to really damage the fabric. So you just want to take it slow and kind of peel it off. But yeah. Um, for no, sorry. Sorry. Scared um, me. I kind of peed myself. <laughs> 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 for Richard mold making, just to follow up on what you were talking about. Um, like, uh, I'm trying to cast like a flexible PLA or ABS or something like that. Uh, what sort of mold material would you suggest? I would go with that, uh, that silicone. Um, it, I know the word silicone sometimes scares people at the expense, but if you go to like, um, like Reynolds Advanced and you get that Mold Max 30, um, it comes in a gallon, you can get a gallon kit, and it's, it, I think with shipping it's about 105 bucks, but that's gonna go a long way. So it's not like, you know, you've just spent $105 and you have, you're going to use it all in one shebang. I mean, you can spread that out a bunch of different parts. So you would you recommend know, that for I would uh, definitely flexible recommend. parts too? Yeah. So even if it's, if it's the slightest bit rigid, I mean, gotcha. because if you're trying to, like, the biggest hang up on faces or nostrils and um, certain parts of the way the face is shaped, if it kind of, you may not see it in your sculpture if you're not quite sure. But sometimes like around like the temple, it'll actually kind of like move back in around, you know, so it's kind of curving back in. That's what we call an undercut, and it's the kiss of death because you'll never get it out unless you have a flexible mold. Gotcha. So the only time I would ever suggest, especially if you're new um, to, 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 to the process, if you're going to use any kind of, uh, you know, the only time I would actually use a rigid mold would be for latex or silicone, because we make a lot of silicone masks. You know, um, that would be something that you can get away with, because one of the parts is really squishy, and undercuts kind of become not as important for trapping things, except for bubbles, and then that, that's a whole different story. Bubbles are like, air bubbles are like the kiss of death. Thanks. Moles, yeah. Hi, um, I am looking into casting uh, with the polyurethane foams and two-part foams. Um, but I don't want a giant block of foam that I have to carve back out I'm looking to make an interior mold um, so that you just get the shell. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to get that measured up, filled out? You, you can, um, if you're good, okay, so if you're gonna, we would call that like an armature, it's a core. So you'd wanna put the core in, um, but again, it would, you would almost want a, something inflatable because you can deflate it to pop it out of the core so that you have the mask. What are you trying to make? Maybe there's just a better way of doing it. So it's a, it's a half mask. So you, you have the outer portion which you would fur. Okay. Um, so the outer portion you fur and the interior portion you gotta have room for the face. Okay. Um, so instead of carving out, like making a big giant block, like you would just a, a roll cast mold, um, I'm looking to have another like inner portion so that I just get the part that I want and I'm not wasting. Okay, you know, but you're not trying to go all the way around. Right. No, okay, that's what I thought you were thinking. Just in the face, a, a plaster generic shape of your face should work. So it would be like makeup. Um, when you put those two pieces together, the foam latex actually just oozes out the side. Your problem is getting that thing 
together before that, that foam kicks off. Um, because depending upon the temperature of the room, I think it kick off like that. So the colder the room, the better, you know, because it gives you more time to work, especially if you've got to band it and clamp it and stuff like that. But essentially having um, a plaster uh, analog shape of a face that you can squish into the mold. And this is how I would do it. I would take that analog human face, sculpt on that, mold on that, then separate and take the clay out and clean it out, and now you've got two pieces that were meant to fit together. And so each time you can just sort of squeeze them together and then sometimes you know put a banding strap around it or something to that effect. And then you'll have time for the foam to kick off slowly. Um, a lot of times what we'll do, if something's gonna kick off fast, we'll put, like there's always an A and a B, we'll put like A in the refrigerator and leave it there for like maybe an hour or so and then pull it back out. That way the temperature is gonna, it's gonna retard the process and you don't have to, you know, worry about boom. Because we've had boom, and it's like, what the? You know? <laughs> and the volume can be a little bit. So just do some tests, you know, because you, you want to make sure you have the right volume too. Yeah. Hello, yes. Adding spring-loaded stunt stilts to a first good idea or the greatest idea and how might we go you're one of those guys <laughs> one of those guys um here's how i do when i do like suits that are like okay like my bigfoot suit i actually constructed the suit so that the the, the lift went on top of your head rather than having to wear stilts because anytime i know you guys visibility is already narrowed Right? And then you've got the encumberment of the, the baggy feet, the big bulky feet, right? So when you're walking, you're kind of dragging. You can actually trip yourself. If you're on stilts, you've kind of compounded that, the likelihood of you face planting it, which is funny for the rest of us. You know? But for you, it's not so great. Um, <clears throat> if you're going to go that route, um, wow, I hate to give you a suggested and then all of a sudden I'm in court. You know, uh, the first part, just, just to be clear, is to not do the stilts and get the height from like start at shoulder. Yeah, like I did with Bigfoot. So with Bigfoot, um, it's there's a guy in in the suit that we did for Dollywood. He's about my height, and we're so we're about like right here eye line. He's a little bit taller, but he's in a helmet, and then essentially on top of the helmet is Bigfoot's upper back and the shoulders cascade so that they're actually cascading down and then his head is like two feet in the top of his head is actually two feet above this guy's head and he, all of a sudden if you're six feet tall you know you've got essentially an eight foot big foot you know and it's pretty imposing and it's just and you really can't tell just the way that he's structured if i had a way to pop it up on the monitor i would, I would show you if you guys go to my website so it's uh escape design the letters fx.com you probably see a picture of bigfoot on there that we did for dollywood worst colored bigfoot i have ever done it was blonde right and i was like what you know how is he gonna you know blend in with his environment you know um not the worst bigfoot i've ever done if you want to hear about the worst bigfoot i ever done i've ever done wait till I think it's tomorrow night. It's my you know WTF uh, panel. It's after hours, so children cannot attend because that's when I come out of my shell, and I'm actually best known as um, the one person. I, I'm the most bleeped person on the Sci-Fi Network, right? So to behave myself takes a lot of control. So you're in you know? a shell right now. I'm in a shell. I'm trapped. And, and I, you know, I actually, when I got on the show, I tried really hard to behave myself. So for like a month or two months before, I'm trying to like, okay, I gotta say darn, I gotta say dang, I gotta, you know, oh, oh, oh heck, or something like that, you know? And it was out of my nature, and I felt like less of a man, to be honest, because I'm, I'm ex-military. And my, you know, my drill instructor said, if, if you want to be a man, you swear like a man. And, and so that, that was, I think I'm dying. Um, oh my God, I am. Uh, anyway, so, so I'm trying to behave myself and I get on the show and like Brian Henson and all of the puppeteers are just filthy mouths. Like, and I felt, oh, I'm home. You know? <laughs> oh yeah, thanks. I think we'll go back and forth. 
Well, it says it's got two bars on it. So this, one, this one's got four. Okay. Two bars. I say, I feel like I'm talking to myself. Your, your panel is tonight. Is it? Uh, the W2F is tonight? tonight. Yeah. If you guys want to hear me just sound off about the industry, there is a rule, though. For me sounding off of the industry, you can't have any recording devices, because if it ever gets out, the stuff that I say, I'll never get another job again. So. <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah, that's, uh, do we have another question? Yeah. yeah. Um, you just mentioned the, uh, the fluke and the uh, static gun and mm -hmm. uh, a few other, uh, I guess you might call them safety uh, recommendations. Uh, are there any other safety recommendations you might have from your experiences and maybe the stories just, that uh, prompted them? <laughs> yeah, uh, just always wear like your, your personal protective gear. I know I sound like, you know, like you know, like an OSHA commercial or something, you know. <laughs> um, but if you, um, oh, yeah. Um, so always wear your masks. Because a lot of, who is it that was asking me about the phone a minute ago? So foam gives off a little bit of cyanide gas. So you don't want to be standing over top of that, breathing that stuff in. It's not enough to kill you, but you know, after a while, you know, it might. You know, um, we deal with fiberglass a lot, the fumes from, especially if you're using something like, um, uh, like polyester fiberglass. You know, that's really, really bad stuff. I mean, they've got new stuff out. You don't have to worry about the fumes as much, but I would still always wear you know, a mask, always wear gloves, things like that. Um, trying to think of, uh, just for your own sanity. Like, just as something as simple as doing a life cast. I can kids, all fun. What's that? Oh, oh. sorry. <laughs> I got masks also. I got made fun of at a sign shop because I wanted to wear this mask with the pink filters. And oh, I got you. The N95s. Oh, yeah. So yeah, just always, always plan ahead. Like, even a life cast can drive you nuts. You know, because you can never get that Elgin in off your hands. And then you're like scraping it off and you've got a time limit. Plus the person's body temperature is actually kicking the Elgin it off faster. And you only got like, I think, oh, so they classify it. There's like 680, 780, and 880. So essentially those stand for, it kicks off in eight minutes at 80 degrees or seven minutes at 80 degrees or six minutes at 80 degrees, which it's all, it's all crap because they kick off way faster than that. And the problem with Elginate is you can't just add more Elginate to cure an Elginate because it peels away. So you actually have to start all over again. They do have some fun stuff. It's in safe silicone that uh, that Reynolds advanced in. Uh, yeah, it's called what's it called? Silk something? Is any? I thought I heard a yeah out there. Um, oh no. Body double is what it's called. Yeah, and that's that's some pretty easy stuff. You don't really need gloves for that because it's supposed to be made to put on your face, but. You know, and then timing. Has anybody done a life cast? Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. The thing that sucks for me the most about life casts are when you can't get the actor to quiet down, and that stuff's kicking off. I told Drew Barrymore three times. I was like, once I start adding water, we gotta get ready. So are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, great. And so I start mixing the water, and Drew's still talking. And I, you don't tell Drew Barrymore to shut up. You know, I mean, or Sandra Bullock, or who else was it, Selma Hayek? You don't tell these people to shut up so you can put this stuff on. So I'm like, well, that's garbage, you know, let's start again. I went through easily 50 pounds of alginate before I actually got to do Drew's, you know, live cast. But, and she's cute as hell, and she's got great stories, and of course you want to listen to it, but when, you got, when you're being yelled at by another guy, you know, it's like, hey, Drew's got important things to do, blah, blah, blah. I got important things to do, and I make less money, you know? <laughs> you know, that's the worst part of it. Russ, I think they've been able to pull up your uh, website after. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no kidding. Screen. Yeah. Was that oh. a particular... So there should be a Bigfoot coming up here eventually. These are some of my lions where you can, that was a deer, I hate deer already. This is like the fifth animatronic deer I had to make. And that would be the character that got me kicked off the Jim Henson Creature Shop. And then I do like, that was a cosplay I did for somebody. Um, some, of these, some of these are the creatures I've, I've done on uh, the Henson show. I did bring some shrunken heads with me, they'll be on my table. I even have a book on how to make shrunken heads. Um, yeah, so this, if you go to like the portfolio, you could probably see, by the way, it wasn't my idea to make me the mascot of my own company. There you go. So there's me standing right next to Bigfoot. And essentially, 
you can see how the lifting of that mask and how it blends, you know, so it, it looks natural, the cascade from the shoulders, and that, that guy is on stilts. So it's safer for him. So that, that, that's a good way to, you know, kind of like keep people from suing you when you make a suit. Where do you see Oh, you actually look out the throat. So that mask comes down to about, there, there's one right above it if you want to pop, yeah. So that mask um, includes the shoulders. So it comes down right about here. You know, so, and then you've got all that space up on the top. So it's, it's a big mask. Um, there's some other masks that can actually, you know, if you go, I think there's a picture of me standing next to one of my werewolf masks. Um, it'll show you how big these, these guys are. Maybe not, okay, I'll have to update that. But, but the masks are enormous. Like if I were to bring one, I would need it shipped to the hotel because the airline wouldn't allow me to, to, to bring it on the flight. So, you know, they're, they're really big masks. Um, I really wish there was like, I mean, maybe my Facebook account or something um, would have uh, those pictures. But did I answer that question? Because I feel like I just went off on a tangent, you know? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> I totally forgot the question. Do you have a question as well? Um, you mentioned about the lack of masks, but do you have any industry pet peeves like people not using gloves or just being stupid when they should be paying more attention to their work or just inconsistencies you see? For uh, like be, be doing production work, like mine is the lack of gloves in the food industry. Whenever I see people not doing that, is there anything you notice that you wish people would follow more? I do. I do think that it's really important, and I'm guilty of not doing it. All right, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't put my mask on as much as I, you know, as I, you know, as I should. I'll come home, and my wife's like, "What were you smoking?" I'm not smoking anything. It's all chemicals, you know. <laughs> so. Um, you know, that's the problem is a lot of special effects artists have died over time um, from chemical exposure. So little things like mixing certain kinds of fiberglass, like milled fiberglass together. This stuff is in your food, just so you know. It's called cavicil, and essentially it's like a thickener for food, but it's fiberglass. And it's the stuff that we use to make, you know, uh, little balls of fiberglass so they can kind of squish them into molds and stuff rather than using the matte material. and it's fine once it's been like mixed with a fluid, you know, because it's 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 inert at that point. It's not floating around or anything. But the fact that it's floating around when you're mixing it is really dangerous because that's where you get things like you know lung cancer and things like that. Um, that the you know like a lot of asbestos buildings. That's why they're tearing all that stuff down. Is uh, mesothelioma or something like that. A lot of special effects artists have been dying off, especially if you worked in the '80s. You know, I mean. Those guys are getting older, and now all of a sudden those chemical compounds have started to take, you know, started to kick them, you know. But so I'm really kind of like I always make um, my employees and my uh, interns wear that stuff because I would like to see them be old special effects artists. You know, so. But, that question. So the deepest darkest part of making suits symmetry. Yeah. So. What kind of uh, tips can you give people to tackle symmetry in uh, a mask or... Don't do it. <laughs> I swear, no creature in nature is symmetrical. There can be small changes, but if you absolutely have to have it, when I'm sculpting, I make sure that if I do one thing to one side, I do it to the other. Have you guys ever heard of Alec Gillis? Um, really uber famous special effects artist, shame on you. Um, <laughs> He worked on aliens, he, he's worked on everything. Alec is like the master, but Alec sculpts one side of the creature completely, down to the detail, the fine detail, before he really starts on the other side. And I don't know how he does it, because that would drive me insane. All I can say is, make sure that you follow the steps of sculpting. You wanna start by blocking things out, getting the geometric shapes, making sure they line up on both sides. And then, um, and then as you start to refine, if you're working on an eye here, and you, and you lay like a, an, um, sorry, an eyelid, a lower eyelid, make sure you immediately do it over here. That way you're kind of, you know, bouncing back and forth. And that helps keep things symmetrical to the best of your, you know. And being anal really works too, you know, so. <laughs>
I am trying to make a werewolf, appropriately enough. Uh, you talked about knowing how to do the basic sculpting things. Do you have any resources you would recommend? Because my last sculpting experience was probably making a pot in some grade. Oh, uh, there's this brilliant special effects artist. He's got these books out. It's called The Workshop with Russ Adams. You might have heard of it. Um, they're really inexpensive. It'll help you through it. Um, lots of pictures and stuff. But what I would do is I would start with an inexpensive clay, you know, and, and just work your way up. And don't mold anything until you're really, really happy with the sculpture. So keep playing with it. Get some friends to critique it. Depending upon what you're doing with the sculpture, like there's a lot of flesh showing on this guy. You know, I actually like doing that um, because it actually shows more anatomy. You know, uh, if you're going to cover it with fur, then you don't have to worry so much about the, the actual details because it's going to be covered up anyway. But um, there's a great clay out there. It's called Wed Clay. W-E-D stands for Walt e. Disney. It's an industry standard. It's been used for years. They've developed that clay for Disney so that they can build these really large sculptures in a really short amount of time. Um, and it's a water-based clay with a, a little bit of a glycerin additive so it doesn't really kind of um, dry out very fast. And you can kind of keep that with a, with a damp towel on it. You can kind of keep that uh, covered and working on it for months. I've actually gone on a contour. I had this really great sculpture and I couldn't finish it before I was done. Uh, sorry, before I had to go on this tour. So I bagged it with some pa wet paper towels and I didn't come back from that contour for months. And when I finally got back, I was like, oh my God, that sculpture is trashed. And besides a little bit of mold, that thing was perfect and I was able to keep, keep sculpting. So this, that clay is great. It's inexpensive. You can get like 50 pounds of this clay for like just under 50 bucks, you know? And then you can reuse it. So you can put it in a bucket with a wet sponge, like a five gallon bucket, and just keep, just keep sculpting. So um, that's what I, I would suggest. The other thing, I, and I know I keep pimping my book here, but um, the books are designed to make you um, an independent artist. So I teach you in that book, every book, I teach you how to make your own tools for the project. I teach you how to make your own like turntables, armatures, um, sculpting tools, all that stuff. That way you don't have to buy that crap from somebody else because that stuff, you know, a sculpting tool is gonna have, it's gonna have another artist's like, like I would never do this, but if it had like my name on it, you're not gonna sculpt like me because you bought my tool, right? You know, you're gonna learn those things as you go anyway. So you can actually get away with sculpting with a toothpick if you're, if you're calm enough and you're able to, to do those things. You don't need those tools that are gonna cost you a small fortune. Those companies like to get a hold of people, like artists, and assume that we have this, this income that's just, just expendable, you know? You know, because we're, we're rich, right? That's, there's no such thing as a starving artist, right? We're all wealthy, you know? I got gold underwear on, man. You know, I mean, so make that stuff yourself. And I teach you how to do that stuff in the book. So, what's that? I do. I'm actually going to be selling it at my table. My publisher was kind enough not to send the books. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a, a list. If you guys want to buy the book, I will get those things ordered and then I'll sign them for you and ship them directly to you so you guys don't have to worry about it. But I apologize for the lackluster of my publisher, you know. This is why I'm not going to use one anymore. <laughs> you know? I think I'll self-publish from now on. <laughs> um, in regards to uh, mask molding, for fine detail work and close-up shots, what material would you recommend? Cell phone or other types? Or um, um, either, really. Either. Okay. It's all about budget. You know, okay. you can get just as cool-looking stuff with latex as you can with silk. Sometimes better because latex is more like a leathery kind of. Uh, like material, you know, it, 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 if you're doing like a bowl or something, it's going to look a little bit more like the bowl. If you're doing a human type figure, silicone starts to be a better, you know, uh, photograph because it's got those, um, it's translucent, right? Well, a cow isn't as translucent as a human skin, so, you know, you can totally get away with latex. Plus, it's the, the, the price tag is so much cheaper. The plaster to make the mold is inexpensive. The clay is inexpensive. You know, uh, the latex is inexpensive for the most part. Um, once you start getting into silicone, you're really talking about like almost like a 60% or more increase in the price. You know, like 
Here's an example, a bucket of latex. We'll say a one gallon bucket of latex probably run just under 50 bucks. And that'll probably make, depending upon the size of the mask, that'll probably make something like a dozen masks. Silicone, you get one shot. And it's about 200 bucks for um, the same amount of silicone. And once you mix A and B together, there's, there's, there's no correcting it. Whereas in a latex mask, you fill the void with latex, and it kind of, everybody do pottery in here? Like the greenware and stuff? You know, where kind of the greenware will start to create that little film, and then you pour off the excess, put it back into the bucket for later, and then that skin becomes a cup or something. Same thing with a mask. That skin becomes a mask, but you're pouring the excess latex off for later use. Not with silicone. Silicone, once it kicks, that's it. You know, once you mix those two together, there is no going back. So, yeah. This man. Um, I saw that you offer classes on the website. Um, did you go to any school in particular? And what is your opinion on the Stan Winston School? I love Stan Winston School. I, mean, I actually have the videos myself. I'm, I'm a self-taught artist. I never went to school. When I was coming up, I, was, I grew up in rural Pennsylvania. So there was like, you can imagine, my school had 60 other kids in it at my graduating class. So it was like a really tiny place, and there was no internet or anything like that to get on any of my skills from, so I actually had to learn the hard way. But, you know, as I learned and I was able to perfect my, uh, you know, my craft, um, I realized that there's always more than one way of doing things, and that's why I started buying some of those Stan Winston videos. Granted, they're not worth what you're going to pay for them now. They were like $39 for a video, and sometimes, you know, there'd be multiple videos, because they always come out with a part two, and they, they break it up, and each one of those is still like 39 bucks. And I was like, okay, you know, that's, you know, education is worth something, you know? It's not like a sculpting tool that's, you know, was made in China for three cents, and now you're gonna pay 12 bucks for it. There's actually some value here. Now they're up to 80 bucks, and if they've broken the exercise up into, and it's not uncommon for them to break an exercise up into four parts, you're paying 80 bucks for each one of those videos, and now it's become ridiculous. Kind of ripped Matt about it. Uh, Matt is uh, Stan's son, uh, Matt Winston. Um, great actor, you've probably seen him in a ton of stuff and don't even realize it. Um, but it's kind of uh, gotten to the point where, you know, the whole point of it was to you know, to garner a new generation of special effects artists, right? You know, but that's not what's happening now. It's so expensive that it's hard to, you know. But I probably have something like $4,000 in videos myself. You know, because there's always a better way to do something. So, yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. So, I have a, a kind of a realistic partial of a griffin, and I'm looking to make realistic looking feathers. Um, do you have tips or quality like materials that I could use for that? There's so many things you can do with feathers. Um, you can actually use fur to make feathers. Like you can trim off some of the excess of the fur and grow it to the stem. Um, you can actually get some pretty cool looking feathers just using things like uh, craft foam, you know, from like Michaels and stuff. Um, on the show, we did uh, we did a creature called Lady Kaka. Um, it was Bobby and I. Um, and we made it out of plastizone, those feathers, every one of those feathers, hundreds of I'm so sick of feathers. And that's when Brian Henson made the joke about Big Bird flying first class while Lewis Carroll had to ride in the back. You know, you know, it's kind of uncool, but... Um, so the suit rides first class, I need to make that clear. The suit rides first class, not the actor inside. Anyway, uh, it was because I kept talking about how many feathers it took to make a creature. Um, it's a great way of doing it if you're going for a more industrial look because it really does pump it up. But be prepared. If you're making your own feathers, you're gonna go nuts, right? It's gonna be like hair punching. You're gonna wanna stick tufts in there. But the cool thing is you can actually color code everything to your specifications. You know, you're limited only by how twitchy you get, you know? <laughs> Uh, for what again? Uh, we used plastizote. Um, you can use any kind of craft foam in place of that. Craft foam might actually be better because um, we had to cut that plastizote really thin to get the feathers to flop. But that craft foam ought to do it really well. Um, the bulk of the suits, just so you guys know, the bulk of the suits that I make, the, the, the core of them, 
are basically um, upholstery foam. And so, you know, you can get so much built up with upholstery foam and then just cover it with fur or cover it with, um, you know, with feathers. We use fur a lot for feathers, you know, especially those down-like feathers. You know, you just cut it. You just sort of make these little triangular cuts and it adds those, those aspects to it. Just perfecting that might just save you a lot of insanity. And always, I think you always work from the bottom up. You know, you don't want to start from the top and work your way down because then you're fighting yourself in a lot of cases. Um, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so I was going to make some um, latex. Uh, they're like uh, prosthetics for your face. To, so instead of actually wearing a mask, making them part of the makeup. Um, as far as sculpting them, are there any like problem areas that you always see people kind of like um, like filling in with the, the prosthetic where they should have like left a cut or like any any tips about like making sure that the prosthetic moves as naturally as possible with the face, face underneath it? If you're gonna do, if you want it to move naturally, right, you're gonna wanna use silicone because latex is not a flexible material. It is to a certain extent. I mean, you can get a little bit of flex out of it, but essentially, when you're talking about minute little, it bunches up. And the smaller the piece of latex, the more rigid because now it doesn't have big expands to, uh, to, you know, to expand for. Um, so use silicone or prosate transfers is another great way to do it. But to make sure that it doesn't look like a prosthetic, you want to make sure you feather out the edges like really thin, almost stupid. It's like, oh God, I'm going to run into my eye at this point, you know, because those feathers are what's going to actually blend it in with the skin itself. And you always and don't be afraid to uh, to make a bunch of little pieces, especially with prosate transfers, because they go together. You can actually build them up on top of each other. So if you if you decide at the last minute, oh, I wish the cheekbone protruded more, you just put another one over top of it. You can actually keep building it out until you get it to where you want. With prosate transfers, <clears throat> it's a freezing process. You don't want to make the transfer itself too thick because the freezing process won't uh, won't penetrate. You don't have this big white center, it's kind of nasty. Um, but when you're layering them, you know this one goes on first, this one goes on second, this one goes on third. And that way you can kind of build up from there. You can build up brow ridges that way, you know. Um, but silicone's also a great option, you know. I mean, I try to tend to stay away from gelatin, because gelatin will rot on your face. Um, it starts to melt off, and if that's not the look you're going for, it can be really, really bad for you, you know, so. Prosate is just uh, the word pro and then aid. It stands for um, prosthetic adhesive, and everybody in the industry just calls it prosate. Oh, yeah. Have you played with oh, Have you played with Warbler? I don't. Did you? Were you in the meeting? Don't ever use that crap. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I played with it once, and I kind of like Yeah. It. <laughs> no, no. I, like, I was talking in the. In the in, dinner last night, I was like, how much I freaking hate Warbla, and, and it's another one of those things where it's like one of those tools that you buy that they overprice, it's crap, all right? There's so many other things you can use, uh, foams, you can use almost anything, just don't use that crap. I mean, a small sheet of it will cost you like 80 bucks, and it's garbage, I mean, and it looks like crap too. I've seen people, they're like, look at my warm replacer, doesn't it look cool? No, it really doesn't. It looks like freaking warbler, you know? I mean, it's really bad, you know? And it's expensive, and they, I swear to God, the product was designed to rob the cosplay community, so don't fall for that crap, you know? Honestly, there's so many better things that you can use. We're you know? about out of time, we got one more question over here. Oh, right, you. How did you get the uh, kind of rough and tough looking skin on that mask? It's all sculpted. So essentially I went in there with like between a sculpting tool and a stipple sponge and a bunch of different stuff. You know, I, uh, you just sort of learn little techniques. Like you can actually take a needle and push it into the clay and kind of pop it out a little bit and you get like goosebumps on it. And then you hit it with some water to knock down anything that might not look quite right. It all comes with critique, uh, technique, you know, you, you, you kind of build up to it. Um, the other thing you want to watch out for is what I call the beginner's um, hesitation. And it doesn't mean that you're a beginner, it just means you're beginning a process. 
So when you're starting to do things like the lines or the stippling and stuff, and you're like, God, that looks stupid. Well, it's only because you did like a quarter size spot. That's why it looks stupid. The more you start adding that stuff to it, the more you can realize, oh my God, now it's coming together. So don't get caught in the trap of the, uh, the beginner's hesitation. Always follow through. Because clay can be healed, man. You just stick some more clay in there where he's like, I don't really like how that turned out. You know, and we all go through it. I punch a sculpture almost every project. I mean, I was doing a video for the, for the Jim Henson Creature Shop. They were actually, uh, they, it was an audition, and my buddy kept rolling. And I remember I was so mad at this sculpture that I hit it, and the side of the head blew out onto the wall. And so we had this, <laughs> we had this wet clay just sort of sliming down the wall of the studio. And I was like, he had it coming. You know, I was like, every sculpture gets decked. You know, I'll beat it in the submission, and it will do what I want it to do. Yep, 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 yep. All right, I think that's about all the time we've got today. Thank you guys so much. Great Thank question. you so much for coming out. I hope it was helpful. You know, if you have any other questions about projects and stuff, I'm heading right over to my table, and I'll be parked there for most of the rest of the afternoon. So feel free to come ask me questions. I love what I do, and I love sharing the info. So, cool. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for coming. Take care. This one you go down.